Hey, 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 good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are tuning in. This is Speechless Live Chat, a weekly uh, video cast dedicated to help cyclists train smarter and go faster. I'm your host, Louis Pa. I am a cycling coach here with the Psychology Saba Racing Team. And with me today, my guest today, tonight with us is Ashton Lambie, who is two time world record holder in individual pursuit. Now, it's not every day that we get to talk to a world record holder and we have Ashton here with us all the way live from Nebraska, USA. Hey Ashton, how's it going? It's going great, Lewis, how are you? I am very excited, I'm doing great myself. Very excited to talk to you. Uh, for our audience um, who is tuning in, uh, please key in lots of questions for Ashton. Um, whether it's aerodynamics, it's about training, about his attitude, um, about his life, put it in the comment box. We will be taking up your question uh, live on the air today. So Ashton, um, we would love to hear you talk about yourself because you, uh, how you got started in cycling. Now, we all know yeah. that you are a world record holder, but before that, what happened? How did you get into cycling? And particularly, what type of cycling you enjoyed the most? Um, so before I started racing track, I uh, did a lot of ultra distance stuff. So I found my dad's old road bike in our garage when I was 15. Um, and that year, I actually did my first century ride. So that was 100 miles that I did. Um, and that kind of got me hooked. I did a little bit of road racing, uh, kind of had a bad experience with road racing in the Midwest. So didn't do that as a junior. Um, but I got into a discipline of the sport called randoneering, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. It's like ultra, ultra distance, but totally self-supported. So basically you show up at the race, they give you a little card. There's a few gas stations dotted around the state, and you have to take that card on the prescribed route to those gas stations. Those are your aid stations. Um, and your checkpoints, and too. Then, yeah, and your checkpoints. And then uh, that's that's basically the race. Like, yeah. you just you, you go do that route. Um, the shortest one is 200 kilometers. The longest one I did is 1,200 kilometers. Wow. So you're out there for like for days. Yes, um, yes. We have something yeah. called Aldax over here. Uh, I, that would be similar. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah, yes. Aldax is the same thing. Yeah. 
so I did those for a good few years. Um, and then when I lived down in Lawrence, Kansas, I got into gravel racing, which is still probably, you know, one of my favorite disciplines, definitely the one I do the most cause that's what we have around here. Um, but like the shortest events for those are about a hundred K and the longest one, probably 200 miles. So I would say on average, they're between like 100 and 150 miles of just like rural country roads, kind of minimum maintenance roads. Um, but again, relatively self-supported. Now, now that is very different from individual yeah. pursuit and team pursuit. So how did you get from riding 1,200 kilometers, you know, a discipline that is relatively, you know, not about speed, it's all about you know, finishing your ride in one piece. How do you get from there to track cycling, which is like the Formula One yeah. or uh, um, of, of uh, cycling? Take us through that, well, please. Yeah, I mean, even though randoneering is like a little bit more laid back mm -hmm. um, and more relaxed, I think one of the one of the things that I learned from that was, um, you know, the the emphasis on speed. We, like even though you still have a lot of time and any second you have not moving or like just learning how to ride to maintain a high average speed and then realizing like oh that's what wins races like nothing else matters in a race or in event it's just like who can go this distance the prescribed distance in the fastest amount of time um so that was like that was still an important thing that I learned um, doing ultra distance. But I remember doing a few gravel races and like doing pretty well. Like I won a handful of gravel races in the Midwest. Um, but like you can see and you see photos of me and my legs and like I'm a fairly stocky guy. Um, not really built for ultra distance, even though like I did yeah. okay at it and I had fun. But so I always kind of wondered, I was like, oh, maybe there's like a little bit more power oriented event that i could be even better at mm -hmm. um and so there was a grass velodrome down in lawrence kansas uh that i did one night i did like a season there in 2016 uh broke a couple track records won all the events um did really well like i was i was like oh man i'm really good at this and so then i was like well let's just see how far we can go like this is an olympic event you know it could work out uh i knew it was like there was like a half a percent chance um but yeah so i did that and then um did some <laughs> bless me. you we got allergies here really bad <laughs> okay it's uh almost harvest but yeah so i did uh the grass velodrome and then yeah just kind of got into more track racing after that and uh so glass yeah, road room is just people riding in circles in a grass field but obviously they you you marked out the the the, the track uh, i've seen some pictures of that so that's pretty yeah. cool so you got you went from uh grass grass uh, velodrome into you know a proper velodrome um so how did you get in uh, so how how do you do in 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 your track racing on the grass how do we do it? Yeah, I mean, how did you do? I mean, uh, the first couple of races on track, you enjoyed it. You won a couple of races. Oh, yeah. I won a few races. I really enjoyed it. Um, we did a few where it was like, you know, like a, a mass start race is kind of hard because like the pole line is really well defined. You know, it's just like a little strip of dirt, maybe a few inches wide. And so that's <laughs> very obviously like the fastest way. You know, yes. if you pull off that, it's just like you're just riding through sand. You just go so much slower. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we had like, you know, we would do scratch and we'd do elimination. And I'd just be like taking laps, taking laps. And everyone's like, just take one more and we're almost done. Like, the sooner you get done, the sooner we all get done. <laughs> so, okay. so then it turned into like, you know, a a 10 lap time trial or something, something silly like that. Okay. Now, uh, tell us about 2017. Obviously, that is the year that you broke into the track cycling scene. Uh, uh, you, you took part in the U.S. National Championship and you won yeah. the individual pursuit goal and you yep. finished second in Omnium 
and Point Race. Now tell us yeah. that experience. What happened to you after that? Tell us about that, please. Um, yeah. So I mean, I kind of showed up, uh, and I knew, you know, there had been talent ID go camps going on. Um, I just like hadn't gotten the call to get into those yet. Um, I was working with. Uh, one of the men's sprint coaches in the U.S. now, uh, Lee Povey. And so we kind of had an idea of like, you know, he he talked to some of the other guys that were at the talent ID camps of like, oh, what kind of times people are running. Um, so I knew my main competitor was uh, my teammate, Gavin Hoover. Um, and it was like, oh, Gavin's good, man. He's a young kid. Uh, you know, he could he was punching right around a 430 and I was like, all right, if I can do this, if I can get sub 430, um, like that was a, a really big year for like my family supported me a ton. Like they all came out to watch. Um, I guess I didn't have a mechanic, but a friend of mine who was doing body work for me down in Kansas, she came and uh, did body work. We had a photographer friend there. Um, so we had a pretty good crew and a pretty good staff and like, I'd been to LA a handful of times, you know, trying to just prep and get some time riding a wooden 250 because at that point, that's the, that was the only indoor wooden 250 I'd ever been on. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, everything just came together on the day. I got into the gold medal final um, with probably about a three second lead, I think. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, that was, I later learned that 430 was like a benchmark for the talent ID program. Um, they were trying to get, you know, four or five guys under 430. And so, you know, for me, just some dork with a mustache to show up at Nats, uh, it was a pretty fast track to the, uh, to the national team after that. Oh, I lost audio. Uh... It's my fault. My bad. My bad. Now, the first okay. time you okay. rocked up at the national championship, uh, obviously not that many people know you compared to today, right? At the at the cycling scene. Um, do you think that most people underestimated you? Uh, oh, it froze. Hello. Hey Ashton, I'm still here. You good? Still Ashton? there. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hang on a sec. Yes, my audio is fine. Ashton, can you hear me? Okay, we're gonna reconnect. <gasps> Wait, sorry guys, we're gonna drop off with Ashton, we're going to try to reconnect with him in a short while. Some technical issues happening, but not to worry. We'll get him back online. Okay. Now he's ringing me back. Okay. Let me try this again. Hang in there, guys. Okay, we still cannot get Ashton back online. Uh, we're going to keep trying until we get hold of him. It was going well until uh, this technical issue. Let me try that again. Try to reconnect with him over Skype. Okay, Ashton. Hey. Hey. Okay. We lost you there for a little bit, but you're back, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me see you. Yes, we have Ashton back in back again. Okay, so we were talking about the first national championship. You rocked up with your mustache and your tats and and um, and your uh, body shop uh, crew and photographer and all that. Do you think that the crowd? Probably not that many people know you at that point compared to uh, today. 
Do you think the people maybe underestimated no. you at all? Uh, what do uh, you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's funny. I've talked to most of my teammates about that. Like, oh, you know, what did you guys think? Like when <laughs> when I just rolled up, and they're like, yeah, we just we just thought you were some dick dickhead with a mustache. I mean, we still think you're a dickhead with a mustache, but like now we know. Oh, uh, <laughs> just because that's like, I mean, yes, the, you know, the kind of like fixie hipster, like that's sort of an idiom in American psyche, yes. and so everyone was like. <laughs> oh, look at this nerd, you know. Okay, which makes sense. I I don't blame them. Yeah, yeah. So um, so when when you beat them, what what was that like? You know, and then you finished with two silver medals as well. What was that like after after you beat them? I think people, yeah, people were just generally blown away, and also like my mass start racing skills are really bad. So I did a lot of like. <laughs> really stupid stuff in the points race and the omnium where people are just like that was my one tactic i had was like there was never any conventional like oh well if this goes then this is gonna happen it was just like this guy barely knows how the race works like we have absolutely no idea what he's gonna do because he doesn't know what he's gonna do until he does it which is like that's still pretty oh true my goodness. Mass start. Like Yeah. I Yeah. Not a big mass start guy. But then that must be uh, quite a national championship with you rocking out with your unconventional uh, race tactics and, and whatnot. Right? So so what happened to you after that? Uh, I, I'm dying to know what happened to you after you won uh, the gold medal in individual pursuit in your first ever national championship by a yeah. guy who was totally I know. What was that like? Um, it was exciting. It was super exciting. Like, uh, you know, I think that was more than I thought I was going to do. Like I would have been okay walking home with like one medal. Um, so to come home with three and then a national title, I was like, I was over the moon. Um, and then I got the call because for when you're in the U S uh, if you win national championships, you're rel you're pretty much automatically qualified for Pan American Championships. So that right after that was my first Pan American Championships in Trinidad and Tobago, um, which was pretty exciting. I didn't have a great result. Like I, I think I was just too nervous. It was my first race on the road. Like, sure. Um, but I remember getting that was the event where I got my first like national team like kit. Yes. Like yes. the first USA jersey, and I was yes. just like. Oh my god, this is so exciting. Yes. Well, it was, it was really fun. For viewers uh, who are not familiar with the Pan American, the Pan American is probably like, it's like uh, your European Championship or your Asian Championship or your African yeah. Championship. It's a continental championship for track cycling that happens every year. Uh, unless, you know, we are in a uh, extreme circumstance like the COVID-19 yeah. uh, uh, pandemic. Not having it this year. Yeah. So, what did the national? I'm just curious. What did the national coach say to you? I mean, when you rocked up and beat the national team, uh, what did they say to you? Uh, well, it was Jim Miller at the time, um, and I think he was just like came over and introduced himself. He was like, "Hey, it's great to see this ride. Like, you'll be getting a call, man. Like, we'd love to have you in the program, something like that." <laughs> Okay, we have Azim Alias, legend. He ca he's calling you a legend. Azim is a thanks, bro. Uh, is a junior it's track cyclist. <laughs> it's all true. No, probably not. Uh, <laughs> Azim is a track cyclist here in Malaysia. Uh, in the juniors, one of the top tra uh, junior cyclists here. Now I have a lot of questions that I want to go through with you. Um, yeah. Um, so you you represented. Uh, you won the in 2017. You won the U.S. National Championship. A year later, you set, you broke the world record in individual pursuit at the yeah. Pan Am Track Championship. Now, how did that happen? So one year ago, you were rocking. You were clocking four minute twenty nine. A year later, you set four zero seven. How did that well, happen? 
Yeah, the the tricky bit. I had uh, world championships in Apple, yeah, Apple Dorn in the Netherlands that year, and I rode a 421, I think. Mm-hmm. And so it was one of those things where like I was just kind of getting into the math behind like uh, environmental conditions and you know like oh if I go up to altitude like how much faster is this going to make me? Um, and that was also a big season because I decided, you know, like when I raced my first national championships, I had to peak for that event. Yes. Um, makes sense. But then you spend the whole rest of the season where it's like, oh, we've got, you know, Trinidad two weeks after that. And you're like, well, I just peaked two weeks ago. Like my form's going to be shit now. Um, and so, yeah, there was like, you peak for nationals and then it was like, try to stay on for Trinidad and then you've got World Cups and then World Championships. And it's like every event was you can't like train through the whole season. Yes. Um, where you have to you have to basically be on f- decent form all the time, which means you can never really be on good form. Yes. Um, so 2018, 19 season was like after World Championships, I was a little fried, at, you know, just from a big season. But I'd ridden a 21 at sea level and i was like all right that's pretty good like if i train through nationals this year and really you know my two peaks would be pan am championships and worlds like what can i do um and so that's that's what i did so i think you know the the fact that i had a 21 under my belt at sea level and then a better training regimen and like better goals but better structure through the season Yep. Um, it was one of those where I would kind of like very quietly thought about it of like, oh, this could be a possibility. Like these are the splits I need to run to now, make this happen. So we, in, be, at the, in 2017, you were training on your own or, or do you have a coach helping you or anything? Lee, like- Lee Povey. He was the sprint, the, the sprint coach. Okay. So he was, he was prepping like you for, that would, yeah, he was prepping you for was, 2017 net champs. Yeah. And then we kind of hit a point where he was like, hey, man, look, like, obviously, you're you've got a future in this. Like, I'm a sprint coach. Mm -hmm. You should probably try to find someone that's like an endurance coach. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started working with Ben Sharp, who was the uh, women's TP coach leading them up into the London Olympics. And now he coaches just individuals. Okay, he's a great coach. I really have enjoyed working with him. Brilliant. Now, um, we have some questions online. Um, what are the environmental factors that you seriously take into consideration for your biggest race? So you talk about getting your heads around the mathematics of uh, yeah. the barometer, the air density, the air pressure, and, and all that. Um, so, yeah, take it away, uh, please. Well, really, it's, it's, really, it's just density. Uh, and so I will um try to so density is a factor of air pressure um oh fuck what is it pressure humidity and temperature Mm -hmm. so air density is just a factor of all those three things it's how much one cubic meter of air weighs and so i would try you know over the course of like a week leading up to competition when we're at the track maybe once or twice a day take uh readings just to see what it is and what the trend is showing what the weather is showing um that'll give you a pretty accurate estimate for like what the density is going to be on race day especially when you got a few people in there um and then basically i mean that just kind of helps steer you towards like what an ideal gear ratio would be um and then what a realistic schedule for your ride would be so you're talking about comparing sea level conditions versus high altitude conditions right or even just track to track like sea level yep. conditions very wildly true true so yeah it so just depends so what do you do you carry around a a, a, a small uh mobile size yep. uh, uh weather station air, air, air density uh, reader air pressure yeah. reader yeah, it's uh, 
Uh, it's like the Kestrel yes. I don't know, RM300 or something. But yeah, you, it's the little red guy that you see all of us with all the time. Yes, yeah. so you have that. So that will g- give you an idea whether it's going to be a fast day and a slow day. And how does that affect your uh, gear selection? Would you go for a, a bigger gear if the selection is favorable for higher speed uh, over yeah, certain days? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Now like I know what my ideal cadence cadence range is. Sure. So if I feel like, oh, I need to I need to gear up a little bit just to keep my cadence the same, I'll I'll do that. Brilliant. Now, um, from training on your own to training with the U.S. Cycling, uh, what differences did you see? Um, do you have do you do you have to train with the team a lot, or you two train separately and then come together for training camps? How does that work? Um. It kind of varied. I mean, from my time with USA Cycling, we had a few different coaches. So we had Jim Miller for a while. Mm-hmm. We had Greg Henderson as our head coach for a little bit. And then most recently, Clay Worthington. Mm-hmm. Um, and they all had a little bit different philosophy as far as like, oh, well, I know that you feel like you need this training, but it's important that you do this training with the team. So, um, yeah, it was different. I mean, I've never... <clears throat> I've never been on a road team. Um, and then even with Hoob Watt Bike, that was very, it was very much a standard of like, all right, we have two track sessions a week. Whatever training you want to do outside of that, you can just go do it. Like, we you, obviously you're here, you know what you're doing. Like, you do what you need to do to show up and be the best you can be on those days. Mm. And it's very different with USA Cycling because, like, we'd also have more track sessions. Like we might have, we might be on the track four or five days a week. Oh, okay. And so at that point, the track sessions are pretty, you know, we're doing TP work for those. Um, We also, you know, wouldn't, that would be maybe for a period of like two weeks. So the track camps were pretty intensive um, and there was a lot of team stuff. But I mean, outside of the track camps, like it was pretty flexible. And I would say even like, leading into competitions and um you know when we're on the road for a longer period of time i think there was a lot more flexibility to like oh hey lambo wants to go do his gym work today like all right fine go get it done you know which was which was good yeah i really like having you know the freedom to do my own training okay or the stuff that i know works for me all right so um Tell us, talk to us a little bit about your uh, 2018 because it, you broke the world record represent, representing the U.S. in the Pan Am Track uh, Championship. So mm-hmm. what was the first thing that hit you when you, when you uh, announced officially as the fastest man on the planet over a four kilometer uh, event, obviously. So what was the first thing that hit you? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> I guess I broke it in qualifiers. So, like, the first thing was sort of like, oh, I still got to get ready for finals tonight. Because I was racing my roommate, Gavin. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was kind of like, oh, I need to go get some food. Like, let's go. Let's start recovering for finals tonight. It's like, okay. maybe I could go a little faster. I didn't because I, I'm not very good at backing up rides, but... um yeah, I don't know. I, it was kind of one of those where like I, I kind of like held it off for a little bit. I didn't really let it set in. And then, yeah, I, it's just such a big thing. It's like kind of hard to process a little bit, especially like in the middle of a race. Yes. So, so when you get back home, when you got back home from that uh, world record setting uh, achievement, do you walk to grocery stores or you pick up your mail or you go to the post office? Do people yeah. recognize you? Do, do people realize, no. you know, in Nebraska? <laughs> no, not at all. It's actually, I mean, it's all right. Like, I, I don't mind it. Um, <clears throat> and even within the cycling community, I remember going on a group ride, like, a little while after the world record, and some, you know, someone was like, oh, I, you know, I'm wearing, like, like national team kit. And they're okay. like, oh, that's a cool, like, American flag jersey, man. Where'd you get that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, man. This Walmart. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what you want me to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
for 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 the sake of our audience, um, cycling is probably not the biggest sports in the United States, right? You have not to, by a long shot. And yes. track cycling is like a niche within a niche, and so you're asking people to pay attention to track cycling in an area that cycling isn't huge, but there's also not a track, so it's kind of yeah. like true. I mean, you have your national heroes, Greg LeMond, uh, yeah, or Taylor Finney. Um, who is the best? There's there, there's this U.S. young cyclist that uh, won a tour or a stage recently, uh, not too long ago in, in the in Europe. But anyway, so road cycling would get more attention, and then that's what you meant—a niche within a niche. So how yeah. does that make you feel that people don't realize what you have done, which is very incredible to to be a world record holder in any discipline? How does that what? How does that make you feel that you know not that many people realize oh. what you have done? Um, I I don't mind it. Like kept you level. Really, <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's probably good. Like I I try to be pretty humble about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know I'm always focused on like what I can do better. Um. So okay. yeah, I mean it doesn't like it doesn't bug me at all. So. T- tell us what's the secret of going fast. Obviously, we, we talk about this. You went from about two, four minute, 29, and then you hit, you know, uh, four, mi- four minute 05 or four minute o- uh, 05 at the second, uh, second time you set the world record. How did you get fast in such a short period of time? What is the secret sauce? Well, it's also not that short of a period of time, right? Like I was training... I've been training full gas for like almost four years. Um, So, I mean, if you look at it, you know, it's like, I think a lot of people get the sense of like, oh, this guy just jumped off the couch and broke the world record. But it's like, I've been riding bikes for, you know, a good while, like training, training full time for, you know, most or at least like while I was living in Lawrence. So that was probably since 2014. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so you know, you take it like, all right, we did a 430 later that, you know, that season 421, and then you go to altitude. I mean, that might have been like a 412 at sea level. Yeah. So it's like just that steady progression of chipping away times. Yes. Um, so what attribute I mean, to the improvement is it like uh, your physiology, the technique and uh, knowing how to pace yourself or what what do you think uh, is behind definitely that definitely not the improvement? technique uh, <laughs> my technique like i'm i'm consistently like not great at holding the black it's something i'm working on i'm always working on um getting the position dialed is huge um you know just like if if i look at my position from my first national championships to now it's insane it's so much different yeah um, S- speaking of that i have uh, i have a picture of um I have a picture of your uh, previous uh, riding position, if I may just put oh, it God. online. <laughs> I yep, can't prepare. So Worlds and Appledorn, yeah. So that was, which year was this? Uh, that would have been Worlds at 2018. Early so 2018, like March right? Of early 2018, yeah. Okay. And then we look at this. This is your latest position. That's Worlds. Yeah, that's Worlds 2020. Worlds 2020 in Berlin. So uh, yeah. talk to us about what what inspired the change in position. Um, what's behind all that? Well, it's all the testing with the Hubwap bike guys. Uh, I mean, just I think everyone's kind of adopting that same position of maxing out 10 centimeters, bringing the arms a lot closer together, getting like a ski that more closely like smooths out that transition between like through your forearm instead of just like, Oh, here's a round bar. Um, and then, yeah, just like getting your head down getting your shoulders up, all that good stuff. Yes. So I think getting the position dialed and then like just some serious gym work, I feel like that helped quite a bit too. Okay. And how many times did you hit a gym a week? At least two, uh, anywhere between two and four. Okay, cool. You touched on uh, joining the Hoop World Bike guys. You're uh, part of the team. 
uh, you guys raised together. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, before you join them, this is a group of very closely knit uh, friends. Um, and obviously, they have their own secret sauce and intellectual property. So uh, how, how did things go when you first joined them? You know, uh, someone who is from another country uh, coming into this close group of friends and racing <coughs> together. What was that like? Uh, it was good. I mean, I, I, that's been one of the best experiences of my track racing career is racing with those guys and like learning from them and training with them. And like, yeah, it's just such a positive atmosphere where they all like push each other to be the best constantly. And, um, yeah, it's a really, really fun group. Um, but yeah, I would say there was a little bit of like, oh, this is a thing we can't show you. And I was like, that's totally okay. Like I, I, completely understand that and i wanted to try to be very respectful of that not like hey i'm a spy for usa cycling i want to bring <laughs> back all this stuff you know like i just wanted to go fast man yeah that was, that was all i needed that and, was fun and if you could go fast you can help the team to go fast right exactly exactly That's the goal so uh so they helped you out with uh they work on your fitting on the bike your position on the bike and uh -huh. all that um yeah and then you went to World Championship this year uh, in Berlin and you went to the finals versus Filippo uh, Ghana. Can you tell mm -hmm. us more about that? Uh, you know, Filippo Ghana, Team Ineos, uh, you know, household name in yeah. road or track cycling. And, really then, and then there's Ashton Lambie from Nebraska uh, yep. sporting a moustache. What was that like, rocking up to the start uh, line? Well, it's funny because, like, I feel like I wouldn't say me and Filippo are, like, buddies. But, you know, like, we'll DM each other on Insta occasionally or chat every, you know, when we're at races together. Um, I feel like the Italian team overall is, like, pretty welcoming and pretty fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I really like those guys, too. Um, I think after the qualifiers ride at worlds this year i was just like i was so floored because it was like a big i don't want to say a big risk but a little bit of a risk for me because this was the first world where we weren't sending a tp squad um i was there at a non-olympic event mm -hmm. so i was like all right i'm gonna ride this kit because i want to ride this kit so i was on a lot of my own stuff um, I was making a lot of my own decisions uh, kind of separate from the national governing body, even, um, you know, like a different bike. And uh, I was like, oh, man, if if I do all this stuff and like ruffle all these feathers and show up and ride like, you know, a 412 and don't even get into quals, like I'm going to look like a big jerk. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, okay. So I was really, you know, to do a better time than I did in Bolivia. I was just like, holy shit, like, this is awesome. Um, you know, I did all the training I wanted leading up to it. I rode the kit I wanted. Um, and it all came together, like, just trusting myself and that I knew I know what I needed to succeed. And, like, to see all that come together was huge. And, like, going into the finals, I didn't really, I thought there was, like, you know, maybe a hair of a chance that I'd beat Filippo. But I was going to go out and try it, you know, and I just uh, didn't have the gas to hang on after, I don't know what, like, it was pretty close for, like, 2K, thereabouts, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but, like I said, I just, I'm not, I, I know that that's a weakness of mine, that I'm not very good at backing up rides within a day. Um, and he is so. I mean, props to him, man. That was a good ride. It was incredible. And when you say back camp rides, so you're referring to kind of like pacing yourself, not empty the tank so much, kind of controlling that energy expenditure. Or what do you mean by that? Um, I would say more like recovering in between rides, you know, mm. because it's like the tricky thing with with like a race like that when it's worlds and the the pointy end of the field is so tight. Yep. Um, you know, you've got how many guys going under 410 i mean that's yes. like that was the world record two years ago and now it's like you got 
four I, I like a four eleven doesn't barely get you into the top eight now. And you're just yeah. like, what the shit happened? Mm-hmm. Um so you really like you, there's no other option than to just go absolutely full gas on qualifiers. Yes. Like you just have to do that. And so I think it's a different skill to be able to like turn around and do a ride six hours after that and only drop, you know, two seconds. Mm, okay. Like it's really hard. I see what you mean. You mentioned about, you know, 411 was the world record two years ago. And the world record is what? 403 right now. And 401. You, 401. Felipe, yeah, Felipe, I think he did a 401 at World. That's right. That's right. Now, 10 seconds improvement. And if you're rocking 411, you may not even qualify to be in the top eight uh, at Worlds. So, w- what happened? What, con- what, attrib- what, what contributed to this sudden improvement in speed, in your opinion? Well, yeah, I think it's a few things. I think it's uh, someone did it. You know, I think like if you look at the four minute mile, that was a barrier for a really long time. Yep. And as soon as someone broke it, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, all these other people did it. Like now it's just it's more like psychologically attainable that someone else did it. Um, and I think the same thing will happen when you see someone break four minutes in the individual pursuit, because that'll happen. That will happen. Olympics sure. coming up within, for sure. Yeah, within the next few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then <clears throat> I think, yeah, probably like aerodynamics becoming a bigger role. Um, you know, more people focusing on their position, their equipment, uh, you know, just aerodynamics as a, as a giant factor as speeds keep going faster. And people just riding bigger gears. I mean, the gear I rode, I rode like a 114 or 15 at Worlds, and that was a TP gear. That was bigger than a TP gear like five years ago. Yeah. So what combination did you run for 114, 115? 6415. 6415. So that chain ring is like as big as your serving plate. <laughs> <laughs> it's bigger. It's a big one. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Now, um, pretty cool stuff. Now, uh, speaking of uh, your teammates in Hope Bot Bike, you know, Johnny Whale at another podcast uh-huh. with, I think, your US teammate. Um, he John said. John Krum. Yeah, John Krum. That's right. That's his name, John Krum. Johnny yeah. said, this is him, not me. Uh, <laughs> Is this the bit about my interval training? Business? Your interval training, <laughs> Ashton Lambie's interval training is absolutely horseshit. That's what he said. How would you like to yeah. respond to that? <laughs> no, he's probably right. He's probably right. Uh, I, I love a good stop. I love riding two places. Like I did as like a four or four and a half hour just kind of like endurance zone two ride the other day. Yeah. And I managed to drag it out for like six hours. Okay. Because I, I like, I rode, you know, stopped for a couple of photos, uh, stopped for a snack at a gas station. I rode past the bike shop that I worked part time at and like chatted with those guys for a little bit, stopped for a little sandwich and an iced coffee on the way back to my house. Yep. But like, I got four, yeah. I got four and a half hours in zone two. Like, I don't know. You That's know fine. what? You tell Johnny, I had the world record <laughs> twice. Eat that, all right? You tell Johnny that, all right? Well, yeah, I'll, I'm trying to get Johnny on uh, on on this uh, video cast one day. You know, he seems like a fun guy to talk to. Now we're gonna switch gear. Uh, we want to go through a rapid fire quiz. I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna give you two things, and then you're gonna tell me which one is faster. Okay. As right. fast as you can, all right. First thing that came to mind. Ready? Yeah. Shaved beard. Shave versus beard. Which uh, one? I would say, given the number of beards on the Danish team, I would say beards. <laughs> okay, you, you're supposed to do it really fast. Okay, you gotta step it up. Yeah. Step up your game. Okay. Jaro Arrowhead versus POC Tempor. Oh, definitely the Pac. Yeah. Okay. Harry ha- Harry Lakes versus Shaved. Shaved, hundred percent. Ashton Lambie versus Damien in. 
Kilo. Oh, Dan would kill me. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Gravel versus track bike. Track bike. Greg LeMond versus Ashton Lambie. Oh, there's... Yeah, Greg LeMond. <laughs> you are too polite. All right. Um, last questions for you. And, and if you guys have any other questions, please post it in the uh, comment box. I have a question coming from Wardren Chi that he sent via Instagram. And he asked, what was going through your mind when you are racing uh, the individual pursuit? What was going through your head? What kept you going? You mean just like any given race? Yeah, I mean, let's say at, at Berlin, uh, qualifying, for example. Individual pursuit qualifying. Uh, what do you tell you? You're counting your cadence, you're counting your breath. What do you focus on during the race? It's four yeah. minutes of eternity. That feels like eternity. Four minutes is a long time. Yep. Um, I mean, I always start off like... I have a playlist that I listen to uh, that's a bunch of songs that are like really catchy and they're about the cadence I need, like between 110 and 115. So like Come On Eileen by Dexy's Midnight Runners. Do you know that song? No. Look it up. Okay. It's super catchy. It's a great song. All right, that's song. my homework. Yeah. Come On Eileen. Um, so that's, that's one that like recently I've been using to start races. And then... Uh, you know, you do that, you kind of get settled in, you know, you've got a little bit of the nerves from like a start. Um, so, you know, you say you take the first kilo to get settled in and then it's like, okay, how are we feeling? There's kind of like a little bit of a check-in. How's the pace? Like what, what have my splits been? <clears throat> um, and then, yeah, basically you have, you know, a minute and a half to kind of just like, just tap it out, focus on the line. Um, before you get to like i don't know the part where it really starts to bite and it really starts to hurt and there's that like big struggle and that that space that you can only achieve in like the last minute of a really hard race and then it's like all right this is like the internal battle this is where you show up or you don't show up um so you know just kind of like getting to a point where you can like prep yourself for that battle of like the last four to six laps knowing when that's going to hit um and just kind of like yeah getting yourself ready for that and then seeing what happens very cool thank you for sharing yeah. that yeah now, i have the final questions for uh for interview what are the projects that you're working on you know um before that let's back up you 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 won silver medal in individual pursuit uh, but you're not going to the Olympics, you know. Uh, can you just walk yeah. us through briefly how the Olympic qualification works for um, for some of us who may not understand that? Uh, can you walk us through, please? Yeah. Well, individual pursuit, for starters, isn't an Olympic event. Okay. So you can't qualify for the Olympics in individual pursuit. Um, I put all of my efforts into the team pursuit, um, where we had to qualify top eight through a point system between uh, regional championships like Pan Am champs, mm -hmm. um, World Cups, and World Championships. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> yeah, we just had a few a few bad. We had some bad performances at Worlds, um, and didn't. We probably could have done a better job of picking different world cups to go to or gone to more world cups mm -hmm. um but yeah we just uh didn't make the cut so what's next uh ashton uh olympics 2024 another world record uh, uh, no, no, uh what are you working on, on? <laughs> uh yeah i mean so the plan is still to go down like either late this year or sometime next year um go down to Bolivia again with the Who Bike guys yep. and try to break records for TP, IP, Kilo, and the hour record as well. Wow. Um, yeah, so right now I just finished up uh, a big gym block. So I was in the gym four days a week with pretty minimal riding, like riding one or two days a week for about two months. But I added like almost 50 pounds to my squat so i was really excited about wow. that wow 
Yeah. Yes. Um, but I did lose a ton of fitness. Like, I you use Training Peaks? Yes. So my CTL was like, like fifty, <laughs> and I was just like, oh god, I'm never gonna get fit again. <laughs> but I'm coming back. It's at like it's almost ninety now, so I'm starting to feel a little bit better. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, it's been like. It's been a little bit of time out of the gym and just like more time on the bike now. Um, and then, you know, just like regular farm stuff. Uh, you got to the house I live in is wood heated. So mm-hmm. can I do you want me to move the camera and show you? Sure, please. You're wow. giving us a tour of your uh, heating system, wood uh, yeah. field uh, heating system. Let's see that. Well, so that big green shed out there, uh-huh. you see that? Yes. So that thing's called the heat source, and then that little area next to it is, like, usually full of wood. Like, okay. we'll probably go through that amount of wood two or three times in a winter to keep it keep the house warm. Okay. Um, so we've got that, and then there's also, I've got a little wood stove in here. So this one's pretty well loaded, but uh, there's a room outside where we have all the firewood, and so I need to work on refilling that. Well, that that stove is like from a movie set in a Western movies or something, you know? That's 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 really cool. If you go buy a wood stove, that's what you get, man. Well, buy a wood stove and then buy uh, timber to chop down, and you're going to improve a lot of fitness, right? It it is hard work. Yeah, uh, You bet. Because you're picking... And it's not anything that's like crazy heavy, but you know, just you spend all day like moving, you know, the chainsaw probably weighs 40 pounds and then you're picking up, you know, big pieces of wood all day. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. So I've got like a pretty quick workout on Zwift today. Um, so I might still have a little bit of energy left over to do some uh, wood chopping today. <laughs> so that's probably what I'll be on today. That's your that's gym work for your upper body and that a bit of squats, right? Lifting your logs yeah. and all that. So yeah, is Olympic 2024 in the cards? Would you want to give another uh, shot? It depends. Yeah, I mean, because like we so with uh, the budget cuts and everything, our uh, TP coach like he got let go. So there isn't really much of a men's team pursuit program to speak of um, right now. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I guess we'll see what happens. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's a long ways off, man. I'll I be know. I know. 33? Yeah. Oh, God. Well, 33 is we'll the see. new 23. 33 yeah, is the new I'm, 23. I like that. I hope so. You know, uh, you're, you're seeing like... Footballers like Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, you're seeing basketball players playing um, way longer than they used to because of better understanding of science and looking after ourselves better, uh, better yeah. training methods, better recovery. So, you know, well, we'll see how it goes. Yep. Ashton, thank you so much for uh, this interview. Please hang around. Uh, so we have a short quick chat after this i'm just going to end the show so for our audience who are watching live thank you very much for joining in uh okay one last question from chan uh hope to see you in ironman triathlon oh don't get your hopes up man (laughs) (laughs) i hate swimming and i hate running (laughs) i can almost guarantee i'm never going to do a triathlon Okay. Sorry, dude. And on that note, thank you so much, guys, uh, who, who have tuned in to our, our chat with uh, Ashton today. Um, if this is something that you like, uh, please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell button so you are notified every time we have a new video coming right up. So until then, we will see you next week. Take care.